Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see y'all. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us for worship. I just want to let all of you know, uh, Bill has had two requests this morning to play Rocky Top. <laughs> and uh, he, he, he says, as a, as a Kentuckian, he refuses. <laughs> He said he cannot play those notes in that order and will not play those notes in that order. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you all for being here today. Thank you for choosing to worship with us. There's a whole lot of places you could be, and the fact that you're here is one we very much appreciate. Uh, if you are our guest for the first time today, or maybe you've been our guest for a while, if uh, you'd like some more information about the church, it's really easy to do. In the pew in front of you, you'll see a guest card. You can fill that card out, and then as you leave today, there on the Welcome Center, out in the foyer, there's a basket for tithes and offerings. You can drop that card in there. We'll follow up with a phone call or an email, or you can just send me an email to john, J-O-H-N, at mycbcc.org. Uh, that's the correct spelling of John, by the way, J-O-H-N. I say that because I got an email from a former church member who's moved to a different part of the country, and they were letting us know they've joined a church, and their pastor's name is John. They said, but he's spelled at J-O-N. And uh, I, I replied, well, I'm glad you found a church, but I'm sorry your pastor can't spell. And, um, <laughs> but anyway, J-O-H-N at mycbcc.org, and I can respond to that. So, but thank you for being here. I want to thank everybody who's involved in our Friday night game night uh, that we had uh, this week. We had a lot of fun and a uh, good turnout. It was just a, a good time all around. So thank you for all the work behind the scenes and those of you who are able to come and, uh, and be involved in that. Pay attention to your bulletin. There's a lot of things going on. Trunk or treats coming up soon. There's a Veterans uh, Day celebration you, uh, that may pertain to you. So pay attention to what's happening on the left side uh, of that page in your bulletin. And I'll ask you to do three things for me this week. Number one, pray for somebody. Pray for someone you know who does not know Christ. Pray for them by name to come to faith in Jesus. Number two, connect. Maybe somebody that wasn't in Sunday school today, maybe somebody that's not in their usual spot uh, out in the congregation, let them know they were missed. Give them a phone call, text message, email, whatever's appropriate for that person. And then number three, invite. Invite someone to come to church with you. If they've never been in the building, meet them at the door. Uh, it's always a scary thing to walk into a building you're not familiar with full of people you don't know. So meet them at the door, sit with them in service, invite them out to lunch afterwards. Uh, but just invite someone, someone who you know that as we are here today uh, is not plugged in to a Bible-believing church. Uh, if they're at a good church that loves the Lord and loves His Word and preaches the gospel, if the Lord wants to move them, He'll do that. But those that you know who, as we're here today, maybe they're still in bed, maybe they're getting ready for Fox NFL Sunday to come on in a little while, whatever it is, if, if there's somebody that's not plugged in, invite them to come and to worship with us and do uh, what you need to do to help alleviate any fears they might have of coming to an unfamiliar place. Well, let me pray for us, guys, and then uh, let's see, what are we going to do first? We're going to sing together first, according to the bulletin, so that has to happen, because it's like the law of the Medes and Persians. We've got it right here, and we're going to follow that order. So let me pray for us, and we'll keep going. Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you for the Sunday school hour that we just had. We thank you for the opportunity to gather in this room to worship. I thank you for those and pray for those who are working in the nursery today, for those who are in uh, children's church and junior children's church as well. We thank you for their service. And Father, we just praise you for the opportunity to worship you together. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing, please? Crown him with many crowns.
Well, good morning, church and guests. This morning, I want to read for you. It's Psalm number eight, and <clears throat> this psalm speaks to the greatness and the majesty of God. It speaks to the value of, of His most prized creation, which is people, His care for us, just His His role as the all-powerful creator and caretaker of, of his creation. And uh, I just want to share this with you this morning. It says, O Lord, our Lord, your majesty, your majestic name fills the earth. You have taught children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set into place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? Human beings that you should care for them. Yet you made them only a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority, the flocks and the herds and the wild animals and the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea and everything that swims uh, the ocean currents. O oh Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. You know, the choir often sings a piece uh, based on that. It's called The Majesty and Glory of Your Name. Right, choir? I know that very well. Let's continue to worship. Would you stand again as we sing, please? Thank the Lord for His grace, grace sufficient for every need, and it's by His grace that we're here to worship this morning. Um, before we pray together, let me let you know we have Children's Church available for children up through the fourth grade. I know children are just ready. You know, they're just, and when I just mentioned Children's Church, it's like they're ready to go right now. They'll be following the prayer, okay? So we'll pray in just a moment. Um, as we pray together, I just want to read from uh, Ephesians 1.18. You know, it helps so much to pray the scriptures when we pray together. And I'm trying to learn this more and more and more and go deeper into that. And Paul writes this, Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. And then he says this, What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? So let's pray together uh, according to the Bible, okay? Let's pray. 
Father, we do worship you this morning as the living God and the everlasting King, as, as Jeremiah writes about. Uh, Father, we thank you for the promises in your word. Uh, they are always true, always there for us to stand on, and a good foundation for our souls today. It's a good foundation for our church. Father, I thank you for the way that you care for us daily. Uh, you give us grace that sustains us, that is sufficient for every need. Uh, there is nothing that is too hard for you, and we just need to remind ourselves of that today uh, as we gather to worship you. We do pray for the eyes of our hearts to be enlightened, to know the hope of the calling that you have given to us, to know this glorious inheritance in the saints. Remind us of the, the riches of the gospel. Uh, we do pray for the preaching of your word. I pray that it would be a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit with conviction. And Lord, I pray that here as the, the people of Covenant Baptist Church, we would be known as faithful followers of Christ. Uh, we want to grow to be more like Jesus in everything that we say and do. And Lord, we cry out for the lost to be saved. That is the desire of our hearts as well. And so, Father, I pray that you'd move in power in this time. Uh, we surrender to you. We submit to your authority. You have every right to tell us what to do and, and how to do it. And so we submit to you, and we look forward to what you'll do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you so much, choir. You know, one of the dangers of being, and many of you are in this, in this boat, of being in church for a long time, for a lot of years, is we get used to words and we forget what they mean. And I want us today to think about the word gospel. About 10 years ago, it seemed like every book that came out for preachers that, you know, people, seminary professors write for pastors and all that, it seemed like everything for about six months was gospel-centered this, this, and this. Uh, we take that word gospel, we put it on the front of music. We talk about gospel music. It, it, it's, it's one of those words that if we're not careful, we forget the importance of it. And so I want us to focus on that word today. The word gospel just means good news. That's all it means. Of course, the implication to that is if, there's, if it's good news, then there must be something to compare it against. So there must be some bad news as well. But let's define the gospel this morning. This is not your text. Uh, you can go ahead and start turning to Genesis 3. But I want to read to you how Paul defines the gospel. This will be on the screen as you turn. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Paul wrote this. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. The gospel is the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ and all the theological implications that come around that. But that's the gospel. And so I want to ask a question this morning of our text. Why do we need the gospel? Why do we need the good news? As I said, the implication is there's some bad news that we need to be told, hey, there's actually something good here. Well, we're going to see the bad news today, and in seeing all that, we're going to, the, the good news just flies off the page. And so if you haven't already turned to it, turn to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. We are going through as a church these first 11 chapters of Genesis. It'll get us up to about Christmas time. And so far, so good. We've been through two chapters. God creates the world. He speaks it into existence. We have the six days of creation, all those explanations of it. We have the seventh day of rest. That's sort of the Google Earth view, as I said a few weeks ago. Then we go down to street level in chapter 2. On day 6, we see the creation of Adam. We see him formed out of the dust. We see him named the animals. We see that there's nobody, a helper, who's fit for him. We see the rib taken from him. Eve come along, that first marriage. As Moses tells us, the language that he uses there, we have that first marriage. They're told to be fruitful and multiply and to cultivate and to work and all that, all that stuff. So far, so good. Until we get to chapter 3. I don't know about y'all, but I'm on page 3 of my Bible. This is about how far we get before it all goes south. So I don't want, I'm not going to read the whole thing at once. We're just going to walk through it uh, a few verses at a time. Notice how this chapter starts. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Now there's a word play here in the original language that you can't do in English. It doesn't work that way. But in the previous verse, the last verse of chapter 2, it says the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. The word for crafty here used of the serpent sort of sounds the same. They're, they're connected in that way. They don't exactly rhyme, but they're, if you saw them laid out beside one another, you can see that there, there's a, a similar sound to them. So Moses is connecting them up with that same sound. And notice who's described here. It's the serpent. Now, we're not told right out who this is. We know from the rest of Scripture that this is Satan. This is the devil. This is Lucifer. In fact, he, he's identified several times throughout Scripture. I'll just read you a couple things. Revelation 12, 9 describes him this way. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown, thrown down with him. And then Peter tells us what he's up to in 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And that's exactly what he's doing the first time we see him. 
He's looking for somebody to devour. He's looking for someone to lead astray. And there's only two people on the whole planet, so it doesn't take a long time to find them. He's going to come, come across them pretty quickly. Uh, and so he begins to talk to Eve. So go back to verse 1. He said to the woman, and she doesn't seem to think one thing about it that the snake's talking to her. So we just we got to take it on face value. She's not like, wait a minute, you're a serpent and you're talking to me. That part of the conversation never happened. So this doesn't shock her at all. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now, this is the interesting thing that, that Satan is doing here. There's a lot going on in this question. Notice first that he, he says, did God actually say? Notice that's just G-O-D. Where in the previous chapter, in chapter 2, we were given, we weren't given this in chapter 1, but in chapter 2 we're given the name Lord. The name Yahweh, sometimes translated Jehovah. And that name is all throughout chapter 2. It's God's name that he gives to his covenant people. It's that relationship name that you and I know him by as Lord. But that's not the name Satan uses here. He just simply refers to him as God. And then he does something very interesting. The command that God actually gives in chapter 2, God gives it in a positive way. Satan couches it here negatively. See, that's why it says he's crafty. Remember, remember Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16, the thing that Satan is referring to, this is how it was actually said. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. So Satan comes along and says, did he say you can't eat of any of this and, and does it in a negative way? Where God actually looked at Adam and said, all this is yours, all the, except for this one area right here. But everything else is yours. I have provided all of this. So God couches it in, in positively of his provision, of his grace, of him taking care of his people. Satan comes along and just all he does is take the same sentence and turn it negatively and begin to sow a little bit of doubt and a little bit of wavering into Eve. Verse 2, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, and notice she falls for the trap because she quotes him just like Satan did. She doesn't quote him accurately. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, which he didn't say in the command, lest you die. So even in her language, she's starting to, to waver a little bit. She doesn't exactly quote the Lord. Satan knows what he's doing. This is what he does. He brings in subtle little lies because he wants to trip us up. Satan responds to her in verse 4, But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. It's very interesting. The best lie has a little bit of truth in it. And that's exactly what Satan is doing here. He says, you won't surely die. Well, the truth is, yeah, they won't die instantly. But they weren't supposed to die in the first place. And when, in just a minute, the sin takes place, death comes into the world. Now, Adam's going to live another 900 plus years after what happens here, but he dies. God's going to talk to him about that later in the chapter. So Satan says, you won't die. You won't drop dead the moment you eat of this, but they will. Death and sickness and all that's going to come in. So Eve hears all of this and ultimately looks at the tree and makes a decision. Verse 6, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Now remember the original audience. This is originally written by Moses to that generation wandering in the desert for 40 years. That, that generation is going to go into the promised land. They're the ones that, are, that are, are surviving the wandering in the wilderness. They're the ones that are going to receive this word of God. They're the ones that are going to go into Canaan. And their ears would have perked up immediately when they heard Genesis 3.16. Because if you'll remember, when God gave the people of Israel the Ten Commandments, He spoke them out loud. They actually heard his voice. It scared them to death. And they told Moses, don't let him do that again. You talk to him and come back and tell us what he said. It absolutely, they could not handle it. But 
they would have heard a word that they would have heard from the mouth of God that she looked at it and she desired what she saw. And it's the word for covet in the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, 17, you shall not covet, you shall not desire your neighbor's house. You shall not covet or desire your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. They would have immediately thought, uh-oh, this isn't good. Even if they didn't know where the story was going, even if they were hearing the story of Adam and Eve for the first time, they would have thought, wait a minute, this isn't going to go well. John tells us a little bit something similar to this in 1 John 2, 16. He says, For all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And it says that Eve saw it, she took it, and she ate, and she gave to her husband, and he ate. And Paul tells us what happened in that moment. Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, so that's Adam, one man, and death through sin... So death spread to all men because all sinned. This is the moment when you and I fell. Adam as our representative. I'm on page four. That's it. And barely on page four. It's, it's the very top left, like the third sentence. We didn't make it long. We did not make it long before we fell into sin. And when Adam did this, I did this, and you did this. Humanity fell into sin. Notice what happens to them in the immediate aftermath. Verse 7, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. It's, it's instant. There's a change. Innocence is lost in that moment. Well, the clock rolls around. It's the time of day for the Lord to show up. Verse 8, Satan would have shown up earlier. He knew God wasn't going to be there in physical form yet. He had to get there first. Verse 8, it's time to have fellowship with the Lord. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. It's one of the saddest statements in the Bible. They had a daily encounter with God. They had a personal relationship. That's the language we use for knowing Christ. They had a personal relationship where God would come into their presence every day, and they were there with him. And that morning, they eat of the fruit, and now they're hiding because they hear him coming. It changed that quickly. Verse 9, God knows what happens. He knows everything. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He knows where he is, but he's got to ask the question. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Adam tells on himself immediately, kind of like a little kid. You remember when your kids and grandkids were small and they tell on themselves? Uh, that's kind of, kind of the, the thing here. He's still very innocent. He's still very new. He just immediately uh, fesses up to some of this stuff. So God continues to talk to him in verse 11. He says, he said, who told you? that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And then you're going to see how the fall affects all relationships. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Did you catch it? He blamed it on God. He blamed what happened on God. In a minute, Eve's going to blame the serpent and the serpent's not going to have anybody to blame. It's, it, some of y'all know the Three Stooges. This is a Three Stooges scene we're about to see unfold, right? I have very few areas of expertise. The Three Stooges are one of them. I'll have to explain to you why that is, but it's the truth, right? You'll watch the Three Stooges, and somebody will slap Mo, who will turn around and slap Larry, who will turn around and slap Curly or Shimp, and they will turn around, and there's nobody there. And they'll usually just shrug. That's one part of their routine. We're about to see everybody blame everybody else, and there's nobody for Satan to turn and blame. But the saddest thing of all, where just the day before, there was that intimate personal relationship where God came in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and Eve were there, and they would have spent that time with him just the next day. Not only did they hide from him, Adam looks at God and says, this is your fault. This is your fault. You gave her to me. 
The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the, tree, the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you have done? This is verse 13. The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So everybody's pointing everybody else. Well, here are the consequences. Verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. And on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. We don't know. There's conjecture. Were, were snakes different before this happened? Did they have legs? That we, we just don't know any of that stuff for sure. But what we know, back to the original audience, they would have understood that snakes were unclean. In fact, it says in Leviticus 11:42. so if you hate snakes, I'm about to give you biblical justification for it. So here you go. Whatever goes on its belly, whatever goes on all fours, whatever has many feet, so just bugs, y'all, any swarming thing that swarms on the ground, you shall not eat, for they are detestable. There you go. So any time they saw a snake, any time, and you'll remember God actually sent snakes among them while they were wandering in the desert. Many of them were being killed because of that, and they put a, a golden snake on a, on a rod, and they had to look up to it in faith to be healed. And Jesus pointed back to that to, to, as a picture of the cross. But, but here they, they understand that what's going on here, and so you have the snake who's cursed. But more importantly, look at verse 15, because this is the first time the gospel is mentioned. Here it is. Verse 15, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. And look how the battle goes. He shall bruise your head. You shall bruise his heel. Well, y'all, a head strike is a whole lot worse than a heel strike. And what that's talking about is the fact that ultimately Jesus is triumphant. This is John 3.16 in the Old Testament. This is the first promise that something's coming. Someone is coming. Someone will come from Eve. Someone who, who is human, we find out later on, not only is he human, he's fully God as well. As thing become, things become more clear over time. So Eve's going to have a child who will have a child, and eventually Noah will be there. And Noah and his boys will survive the flood. And Shem eventually will lead to Abraham, which will eventually lead to Judah, which will eventually lead to David, which will eventually lead to Jesus. And that's what he's talking about here. This is the first time the gospel is mentioned right there in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. It'd be great if it was 16, but it's not. It'd be easier to remember. But Genesis 3, 15, he says, he will, he will bruise your head. In other words, he will win. Paul put it this way. He picked up on the language in Romans 16, 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. One of the great things about the Bible is when we find times of God's judgment, which is what this is, if you look, you can always find His grace. You can always find it. And here, right in the middle of you and I falling into sin, right in the middle of us losing that relationship with God as it was meant to be, God gives us the reminder, Jesus is coming. In fact, it's the first time He tells us. Christ is coming. So now he looks at the woman, he looks at Eve. By the way, we, don't know her, we still don't know her name. They keep calling her the woman. We're not actually told her name until later in the chapter. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Apparently, childbirth was very different before the fall. Adam and Eve were told to be fruitful and multiply. Having a family and having children was part of God's plan from the very beginning before sin ever came into the world. But now it's different. Now it's painful. Now it's dangerous. Now, now things are difficult. So that has changed. And then the very relationship between Adam and Eve, which was absolutely perfect. They were both innocent. They were, they were completely complementary to one another. Now there's going to be conflict. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. The same language in a very similar way is used in the next chapter. In, in fact, we'll get there next week. When, when, Cain, when Cain's offering is rejected, right before he kills his brother, the similar language pops up when God is talking to him. And he says this to Cain in, in Genesis 4, 7. If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. He's telling Eve here that you're going to have trouble. You and Adam... While things have been great so far, now there's going to be some conflict. 
where before you were complimentary, you were standing at his side, you were right there together, you were a, a helper made for him perfectly, you were complimentary. Now it's going to be tough. Y'all are going to struggle, you're going to fight, you're going to fuss. Everything's going to be more difficult than it should have been. Adam standing there, God hadn't said anything to him yet. Verse 17. And to Adam he said, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. You shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you will return. He looks at Adam, he says, okay, because you sinned, this very ground that you just had to cultivate, this very ground that I told you to work, this very ground I told you that you had dominion over, now it's going to fight you. It's going to fight you. And work is now hard. This is why, the, the, the most immediate thing, this is why you get weeds in your yard, by the way. It's not supposed to be that way. This is why you got to take care of your flower beds and, all, and weed them and all of that, because the ground is cursed. That's why there's always difficulty now when it comes to, to work, even if you're not in agriculture. I mean, ha how difficult. Where, you know, if I said last week, if things aren't good at work, everything's miserable in life. Because we were made to be productive. We were made to honor the Lord with our work. And now he's telling Adam, even that's going to be messed up. And so whether it's, whether it's interpersonal relationships at work, whether it's people who actually work with the ground and it fights them back, whatever it is, things have now changed. Things have changed. So relationship with the Lord has changed. Relationship within the marriage is now more difficult. Work has now come, become more difficult. And oh yeah, Adam, by the way, now you're going to die. You were dust. And to dust you're going to return. Paul sort of picks up on this and talks about how the whole world is affected by Adam's fall. In Romans 8, 19 and 22, Paul wrote this. For the creation waits for eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. This earth has fallen. The very ground has fallen. The world has fallen. We, the only part of God's creation made in his image, we are fallen. How's the story wrap up? Look at verse 20. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. That's what the word Eve means. It means living. And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Once again, the original audience, their ears were perked up. The skins of the sacrifices belonged to the priest. They would have known that. So they would have immediately associated what happened here with sacrifice and the sacrificial system. Very much like what happened in verse 15, that promise that something is coming. Now the promise of shed blood. The promise that there is a priest. There is somebody who's coming to take our place. Someone to be there for us. Verse 22. The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. That's true. Innocence was gone. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat. So he would live forever and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken, of which he'd just been told is going to fight you. It's going to be tough. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword, so don't accidentally walk into this thing, a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Which, of course, that whole area, the flood, would have, would have wiped that out. We don't see the tree of life again until we get to the new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. We will see it in eternity. It's there. But it's gone once the, once the flood comes. Let's go back to the question I asked in the beginning. Why do we need the gospel? Why do we need verse 15? Well, it's simply this. Our sin separates us from God. It's just that clear. 
it's a, it literally happened here. My kids are going to say, you said literally. I meant to say it on purpose. I'm convinced we need to get the word literally out of the English language. This is a total side note. It's way overused. And I'm telling you this now, you'll hear it from now on. Every, it's used for everything. But it, I'll not use literally, actually happened in that these folks, Adam and Eve, are separated from God. Where they saw him every day, in the cool of the day, he, he walked and they had fellowship with him. Now they've been kicked out. You and I were kicked out of that relationship with God. Romans 5.12, I think I've already read it once. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. That's why Paul would write, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody you ever know, including you, including me, including everybody, is a sinner. You know that about them. They're a sinner. There's a consequence for that. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. That's what Adam's told, to dust you shall return. That's both physical death, but also spiritual death, that separation from God. But the rest of the verse says, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's 3.15. He will bruise you on the head. Romans 5.8 says, but God showed his, shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The fulfillment of Genesis 3.15 is Jesus coming into the world, living a life I can't live that you can't live, going to a cross, shedding his blood for you and me, dying, being buried, rising again on the third day. The good news, the gospel, so that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what he's talking about in verse 15, that somebody's coming. The, the seed of the woman is coming, and there's victory in that. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 describes it this way. For by grace you have been saved through faith, through trust. And this not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. And Paul puts it this way for salvation in Acts chapter 20. He's talking to a bunch of preachers that he had, had trained up. He's talking about his ministry with them. He says, How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Why do we have to repent? We have to repent because we've all sinned. We have to repent because Adam ate of the fruit. We have to repent because we've all been born separated from God. We have to repent because we are sinners. We ask God to forgive us of our sins. We walk away from our sins. We leave them behind us. That's what repentance is. It's a turning around. It's a walking away. We have to place our faith, our trust in Jesus. The one promised in verse 15 of chapter 3. The one that becomes more clear as we travel our way through the scripture. As we get closer and closer to the end, that picture from, of the promise in Genesis, in Genesis 3.15 becomes so clear to the point where there on the cross and with the, and now the empty tomb, we understand what was being said. But we have to place our faith and our trust in that. Surrender ourselves to him. In fact, Paul would say this in Romans 10.9-13. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. And then look at verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Why do we need to be saved? We need to be saved because we're lost. Because we've lost that relationship with him. Because of what happened in Genesis 3, we come into this world separated from God. But God in his grace and in his mercy, even in Genesis 3, said somebody's coming. Somebody's coming. And we know it's Jesus. We know he died for us and that he was buried and that he rose again. We know the gospel is true. And if you have repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus Christ, if you are a believer, here's what I want you to do today when we have our, our response time, our invitation in just a minute. Praise Him and thank Him for your salvation. I said sometimes we get used to words. It's real easy to get used to being saved and to take it for granted. So today just say, Lord, thank you for saving me. 
I praise you for who you are. I, I, I worship you and I surrender to you daily because you are my Lord. And just worship him and thank him. Or pray for someone. I mentioned at the beginning of the service. Pray for someone you know who is still under the curse of Genesis 3, who has not been rescued from it, has not been set free from that. Pray for them by name to come to faith in Jesus. But in a crowd this size, and however many we have watching, and however many will watch during the week, people continue to watch our services during the week, both on YouTube and Facebook. So this message will go out quite a bit. If you're here today, or you're listening, or, whatever, or wherever you are, have you repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus? Genesis 3.15 said, somebody's coming. Somebody's coming. Somebody did come. Jesus came, and he died for you. Today, will you surrender to him? Give your life to Jesus. I had a, a preacher friend one time said, all he wants is all you got. He wants your all. That's what surrender is. That's what repentance is. It's admitting, I can't do this, and I need you. Are you saved? Are you a Christian? Today you can. You can call on the name of the Lord and be saved. In just a moment, we're going to have our response time. You may want to come and talk to me. If you need to give your life to Jesus today, I've told you everything you need to do. Right where you are, you can call on the name of the Lord and be saved. Come forward. We can make it public. Today, pray for someone you know who doesn't know the Lord. Today, thank him for the fact that he saved you. Page four in my Bible. I don't know what page y'all's. Depends on the size of your print, really. But we didn't make it far. But here's the great thing. That also meant we didn't make it very far before God got to tell us, Jesus is coming. He threw it in there as soon as he could. Somebody's coming, and he came, and that's Christ. Do you know him? Have you thanked God for the fact that you know him? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for preserving uh, what happened uh, in the garden for us to know. We thank you for uh, showing it to Moses so he could write it down. And now for thousands of years, we've been reading it and people have been responding to it. Father, if there's one listening today, one in this room or one who's watching who doesn't know you, I pray they'd call on the name of the Lord and be saved. And Father, I pray for every believer that we would simply praise you and worship you and thank you for our salvation. And we would pray for those we know who do not know you. Lord, we ask you now during this time of response to move among us. We pray this in Christ's name.